think we're having troubles hearing you, Adam. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Oh, hello everybody. Welcome, Perfect. Welcome to the talk. <laughs> uh, that was a bit uh, annoying. Apologies for that for everyone who's sitting there waiting for it to be to, to hear me. This is the Arctic Bookshop talk number 24. Hello to you all. Um, you've already heard from our presenters. Here they are. Hello, Caitlin, Chrissy, Hi. Gilbert. How are you all? <laughs> Hi, very good. It's good. I'm good, thanks, Adam. <laughs> Down. Hang on, we're losing you a little bit again. Oh. It's just a bit echoey. We can kind of hear you, but there's a bit of feedback. Okay. How, so how's Melbourne lockdown going? It's not as bad as it was, that's for sure. Things are looking up. We've got a public holiday tomorrow, so I think it's good weather. And now we can go 25k, which is phenomenal. Awesome. I can go visit my niece and nephew tomorrow. So awesome. I'm happy. It's public holiday for the G, isn't it? For the AFL Grand Final. Yeah. yeah. Even though it's not in Melbourne anymore. The G's in the gather. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll take it. Absolutely. How about you, Gilbert? How's the, how's the lockdown been? Well, I guess this week is the best week of all the lockdown. I finally can get my hair cut, which I've been looking forward to. I can travel more than five kilometers <laughs> and pick up all my shoppings that I have done and couldn't pick up. So that was great. It's the small things in life. Getting a haircut makes you feel like you've got your life in order, doesn't it? <laughs> Definitely. It's like, I was like, oh my God, I'm running out of product. I can't fit it in the head anymore. I just do not know what to do with this hair. <laughs> First world problems. <laughs> How about you, Chrissy? What's the best thing I about think, getting I think in the 10Ks? Agree. Yeah, the, the 25 kilometer radius has definitely been a uh, blessing because we can actually... I, I'm going to sound like the um, the Brighton lady that I'm sure you've all seen on um, on the news, but, you know, I'm sick of walking all the streets of Collingwood. <laughs> so I'm excited to be able to go and, and explore some different parks and, yeah, catch up with friends and family. Awesome, awesome. Well, well done to Melbourne. You, I think you, well, today you only had a, like two or three cases in Victoria. Is that right? Excellent. That's news to me. I've, yeah. I've stopped looking, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, it's small enough. Good news. Small enough. Yep. Small enough. So, for everybody, um, tonight's talk, uh, we I asked the guys to come on. Um, I put a bit of a shout out to, actually to everybody just to say who would like to come on. And um, I thought it'd be uh, the, the guys from Woods Bagot. These guys from Woods Bagot put their hand up and said we'd love to do it. Um, you guys can have a go at sharing your slides if you can. That would be awesome. Um, and I thought, why not? We often hear about. Um, presentations from people who own their businesses and uh, kind of the name on the front door but actually it's quite nice to acknowledge that there is uh, in every office there is the need to have a really great team and a collaborative team to ensure that there is uh, great outcomes. So the guys from um, Woods Bagot I've called the bright young things. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Caitlin, Gilbert and Chrissy here tonight to talk through essentially the idea of competitions, competition in, in, your, in kind of the job and competition in the office, I suppose. So, Caitlin, I think you're the first one up tonight. Yes, thanks, Adam. I think this is an interesting opportunity as well in COVID times to think about that idea of emerging designers as well. We've gone six months now not being at arm's reach from our principals all the time. And putting together this talk, it was one of those opportunities for us to reflect on how we got to where we are in our careers and what were the opportunities that helped us become who we are today. I'm going to start just a really quick overview for us what Woods Bagot means. So Woods Bagot is actually made up of two entities. There's WB, which is the architecture, interior design, master planning side of the business, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. We also have Irico, which is an experienced design cons consultancy that started up 12 months ago and spans the disciplines of urban systems, user strategy and brand experience. Collectively across WB and Irico, we have 16 studios all around the world and in six different countries. 
that's a total of at least 700 staff. So we're very big, we're very complex. There's a lot of us, we all have very different roles and there's a lot of talent. One of the questions I often get asked when people find out that I work for such a big firm is around the idea of, you know, it must be so hard to stand out from the crowd when you work somewhere so big. How do you find your own voice? And it must be so competitive. But that idea of competition is really what we want to talk about tonight. And we want to flip it on its head as well and say, it doesn't actually need to be a negative idea. And this idea of competition not being a dirty word. Tonight, you'll hear from Chrissy Gilbert and myself as we'll go through our own personal journeys, working on very different design competitions at different scales. And we'll discuss how we've had the opportunities to grow and have carved our own career pathways. To give you a little bit of introduction on each of us, so I'm Caitlin Murray. I am going to talk through tonight about an internal design competition at Woods Bagot. Hi, I'm, I'm Gil. Hi, I'm, I'm Gil Gander, and I'm part of the Studio Australia team called The Collective, and we focus on winning competitions and enrichment. And I'm Chrissy Patris. I'm an interior designer with six years postgraduate experience from RMIT. I work across all sectors and all phases of a project and typically sit within an architectural team. Um, and that way we can blur the line between the disciplines of architecture and interiors. Uh, and today I'll be presenting the Sculpt Form Showroom, which is a very unique and crafted project, which I was lucky to be a part of from completion, competition to completion. Adam, it's getting really feedbacky again. I can't hear. Sorry. We're not getting any feedback um, on this end, so okay. I don't know whether it might be just your connection. I'm not sure. Sorry. All right. I'll just keep talking. All right. So to give you an overview of what we're going to go through tonight, I'll briefly run through what competition means to each of us. And then we'll each break it down personally on our own experiences. We'll come back together at the end and go through a bit of lessons learnt and then go through our key takeaways. And we'll also um, go through any questions that arise. So if I'm not, Adam, what's the best for, way for people to send through any questions if they've got some questions along the way? Is it through your Instagram? We'll see if you've got any questions along the way. I think Adam said the best way was to send them through to his Instagram as a direct message. Gilbert, can you hear me? I've just, or have we lost Adam? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right, I'll just. <laughs> and what does it mean to us? I think when most people think of the idea of competition, this is the first type of image that comes to mind. It's the idea of jumping into a battlefield and it's something that's really intense. Words like rivalry, opposing, fears, battling, grueling. But as we've said before, it doesn't have to be a negative thing and it's not a dirty word. What we're gonna go through tonight is really understanding the spirit of competitive nature and what that means to us is this idea of competition being the spark and it's the spark that has ignited the burning desire for our um, each unique career trajectory. We see this as competition being as a way of sparking conversation, competition sparking connections, competition sparking creativity, and competition sparking initiative. So how did competition spark these opportunities for each of us? I'll start tonight by going through my own unique experience working on an internal design competition at, at Woods Bagot. In July 2018, Club WB ran its inaugural design competition, which my team was the winner of. The image on the background here is our, the master plan of our proposal. I'll talk through the brief in a moment and touch on briefly our ideas, but really my talk is going to be focused We're having a problem with you, your um, headphones, Caitlin. Um, we can't actually hear you. Uh, still can't hear you. I think the microphone might be too far away from your face now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, cool. I was just 
getting heaps of feedback, so I had to take them off. All right, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Cool. Perfect. Do you need me to go back a bit or keep going? Uh, keep going. We only missed the last uh, word or two. Oh, perfect. Cool. So the brief for the competition was to reimagine a three-bedroom home on a 200 square metre block of land. It was open to anyone in the studio and groups of up to three could enter. We had a month to put together the proposal and each team then presented in a Pecha Kucha style night with seven minute presentations. Our studio executive recognised that this was a really great opportunity that we were putting on. So they put forward a prize as an overnight trip to another Woods Baggett studio of our choice around Australia. For the competition, we had three external judges. So there was no bias in who the winning team were. We had Dave Martin from Small Giants, Linda Chang from Architecture AU, and Dan Brady from Development Victoria. The event was a really fun and great night for the studio. We all downed tools on a Friday night and gathered in the auditorium with some wine and cheese in hand, of course. This is my team presenting our winning entry. It was, so the team members were myself and two other members from the Melbourne studio, Tristan DeRosa and Wesley Bajan. So, oh, how did this competition provide a platform for me to grow, apart from a little bit of sightseeing in Perth? Competitions as a way of sparking connections was a way for us to connect with others in the studio in a way that we wouldn't normally have an opportunity for. I'm a user strategist, so I typically work on master plan type projects. So this speculative and abstract type of competition brief is really comfortable to me. The other two guys on my team, much more delivery focused architects. So having such completely different ends of a spectrum of a project coming together made some really interesting discussions. You've got myself, like loves a one to 5,000 scale drawing with someone much more comfortable in a one to five detail. It was an interesting experience. It also created a really strong collaborative studio culture as well, because everybody was working on this competition, their own different teams. So a way to see different people's strengths as well outside of standard project. Competition sparking creativity. It's probably one of the most obvious sparks I can talk to. I think those of us listening that studied design can all fondly reminisce about those days at uni when you didn't have to worry about those boring things like combustible cladding or building compliance or a structural engineer killing your dream of a 60 metre cantilever. Because this competition was speculative in nature, we were able to have those unshackled design moments and just see where our imagination could take us. It makes me again think back to that time at uni, learning all about Archigram and just how relevant they are to architectural history today. Just last week, I was even listening to Patrick Schumacher from Zahara Did Architects talk about the difference between art and design. And when you are working in that pure art realm that has no limitations by performance, you can be purely experimental. And then how that experiment can lead to a design outcome later. For our proposal, it wasn't wildly speculative or anything, but we were looking at a modular home and seeing how that could be used to have a financial accessibility for people. So really reimagine the idea of a home deposit and people trying to break into a housing market. We looked at the idea of not needing to necessarily buy the land and the house, but then also find ways that you could potentially just buy a module and lease the land. Say if your neighbor that was a retired couple that wanted to downsize and keep some cash flow. If we hadn't had, like if it was based on a real competition with a real client, I can't imagine we would have had that economic focus. And it was that point of view that became really interesting rather than an actual designed outcome and what was a real conversation starter. So my last two points I wanna to touch on is the idea of competition sparking initiative and competition sparking conversations. And these two for me personally were the ones with the biggest platform for growth. When we won our prize, we could have just gone to Perth for a few days, presented to the Perth studio and spent the rest of the time hanging out at Frio or on Loch Ness Island. But we saw it as a really good opportunity to create a study tour and actually go down and visit the housing developments that were case studies for our proposal. Using our ideas, we, as a conversation starter, we reached out to David Barr of Gen Y Housing at um, White Camp Valley and also went to Space Agency's office to discuss their proposal for Bow Groupen. So it was a really great way for us to meet with other people that were facing the same issues that we were 
and how they dealt with it in their own experiences. Once we got back to the Melbourne studio, we presented to the studio again, so got up in front of the whole audience. that a lot of people have different opinions on. It was, again, has been a conversation. We're losing you again, Caitlin. I think your microphone just keeps slipping further away from your face. <laughs> is that better? That's better. I think there might be a, a loose wire in it or something, but keep, that, that, that's much better now. Cool. All right, I'll just sit like this. <laughs> uh, this is actually the seventh time that I've spoken about this competition in some way or another. To give an example how I've used it previously, this was Wes and I speaking at a networking event with Engineers WSP that Club WB put on. So we talked about it in a way that would teach these engineers about an, an architect design process, but because it was about volume housing, we were then able to have a really great discussion at the end about the future of housing. No, we've lost you again. There's definitely something wrong with your connection. I don't know what it is. Um, apologies to everybody. <laughs> I, it keeps going louder. That's my better. Ears. Yeah, it's strange. I, as soon as I get echo, then I can't. That, I think when you drop me out. Is that better? Okay. Um, what this experience through competition has shown me is it really wasn't about the competition itself, but it was about where I was able to take it through going through all these different presentations, I was really able to develop skills that I just wouldn't have had an opportunity to just on standard project work. My role now is really design relation focused. I was able to develop so much public speaking skills really through Yeah, you're dropping out again on us. I don't know what it is with you. Yeah. It's your connection maybe. Very strange, I've never had that before. How about now? That's good. Um, I'm just wrapping up anyway. I'm trying to think where I was talking. Oh, just because I've had these different experiences in developing different presentation styles, it really helps me now when I do get to go into those big client presentations or running a big stakeholder engagement that I've got the confidence in myself that I know that I am capable. So that's been my experience on an internal design comp that really, because it was internal, I got to do whatever I wanted with it and take it whichever way I wanted to. Gilbert, I know you're very different when you work on big competitions that have a really strict evaluation criteria. But I, think the I think one of the similarities though between us probably would be around the idea of just getting to meet different people and hear from other people's experiences and perspectives. Yeah, agree. Well, just like what Caitlin said, competition in any form, whether an open competition, invited competition, or even to the scale of a PPP, sparks connection. Competition give us the opportunity to background and expertise. And I'm really fortunate with the role that I have because it has resulted in me working on a few projects recently in my eleven projects regionally as well as such as FGFC, TLN, John McEslin Partners, as well as Jess Max. The collaboration with MVRDV was very meaningful for me, personally, as that was the very first competition I did upon joining with Baggett. And because the whole competition revolved around the idea of future cities and working closely with Winnie Mass and their team, the topic of future cities is something that Winnie had been exploring and advocating for. I felt like there was so much learning experience and progress and exchange of knowledge and passion, which was very rewarding. In this talk too, I want to talk more about my experience focusing on competition realm, besides just talking about one we're losing you I don't know what's going on I can't work out why you're dropping out um, this, this has never happened before so I'm not sure hey, what's going on Gilbert I was finding are you getting a 
like gets really loud in your ears. Yeah, it was like a train passing by. Yeah, when it gets loud, just stop for a little bit, wait for it to go down, because when it's loud, we can't hear you. Okay. So, Adam, I actually space. think it's the, the sound coming from um, you. I'm no. sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah. everyone. We're turning off. I'm turning off all of my. Um, oh, how strange. Yeah. So anyway, uh, sorry, everyone. see how you go. Okay. And that itself is collaborating with more than 100 different brains from all this world. How awesome is that? And how much creative juice is produced? That also leads to the next point I want to talk about, which is competition sparks creativity. In the, in the 30 projects that I had delivered, whether in a team of two or 20, they are made of different brief, different sectors, scale, and most importantly, 30 different ideas. In every single project that we do, we have each bespoke story to tell, and that's where creativity is important. That creativity to draw inspiration from everywhere, be it the nature, art, local culture, and history, or even the people, that is also when collaborating with different people, different firms allow us to learn from each other and their way of thinking and how they generate ideas and vice versa. But generating inspiration and ideas is not as simple as that. There are tons of research that had been done prior to deciding if one topic could be used as an idea or inspiration. The next challenge is how do we represent that idea in the clearest yet appealing graphic to tell the stories. That, to me, is what it means by competition sparks creativity. Besides just thinking about architectural solution directly, we are constantly thinking about the stories and narrative that fit and inform that solution. I must also admit that my graphic presentation has been informed a lot. But, but that is not all. Competition, due to its short and sweet nature, in most cases, also sparks initiative and challenges. They require good time management, trust within the team members to delegate tasks based on each of our expertise, managing expectation internally and with the clients, strategic and speculative thinking, determination as well as the maturity and ability to digest both the win and loss. Being in a competition Being in a competition is also like being in a pressure cooker. I like my food a lot, so I think that this metaphor resonates with me. Similar ingredients could be put into different pressure cookers with different way of cooking, and that will result in different dishes as an outcome. Are they all delicious? Probably yes. Do all of the pressure cooker work their hardest to cook their own respective dishes? Also yes. But at the end of the day, a competition is a competition. The and that is subjective. Or in some cases, the dishes that are priced the best win. Of course, there are cases where sometimes the winning dish. Gil, just hold up for a bit. I can't hear you. Try that, Gilbert. And that makes you question where to draw the line between fulfilling the brief and not getting too restricted that doesn't allow you. It is simpler and briefer. Gil, wait. <laughs> uh, 
there's something going on. I don't know whether it's because we've got three different people. Do we want to start over? That's a good one to sit on, Gil. <laughs> 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 that's exactly that's the point, funny. isn't that's it? That's quite a good point, yeah. It's like, when it's all going bad, what are we doing? What's happening here? Oh, apologies. Oh, my God, I, don't, I actually have no idea. It's technically, it's sounding like it, it, everything is set up, so it sh should be working fine. So, give it a go, Gilbert. Keep going. Sorry. Uh, because it can get very, or it is actually very exhausting, but also it is that dedication, determination, and competitive nature that keep us going. All of these qualities create this imaginary reset button where you press and you kickstart again, better and stronger each time. For me, I had pressed that button 30 times by now. What happens in the pressure cooker stays in the pressure cooker. That is the case most of the time. All people see is an outcome, and that leads to the last part that I would like to discuss today, conversation. So, did I fly you here just to draw some diagrams? That was one of the very memorable questions that I was asked by one of the team members when I visited one of our other offices to work on their competition. And that to me is memorable, not because it might be seen as ignorant, but because it shows how little people know about what happens inside the pressure cooker. And it can also be seen as a conversation starter. Competition is very hard to talk about most of the time because the timing is short. One minute you're working on this, the next minute you're working on that. It's like no one knows what is inside the pressure cooker. And also competition can be all confidential, even within the organization itself. So when we don't win the project, they do not get talked about at all, which can be a bit disheartening sometimes, but that's the nature. I can be given this opportunity to share my experience on this platform this evening, all thanks to the numerous numbers of competition and of course to you, Adam. Sometimes when we are also lucky, a competition can be a media darling, just like what happened with the SoftBank by Bula competition, where our proposal called the stack, even though it did not win, was everywhere on single, every single media channel. And everyone who had, I know who had access to the internet, to the media, to the news, social media, they were all talking about it. And I could proudly share about what we did with our scheme, the thought process, and how every single decision and aspect of the project, it was carefully crafted, and there was lots to think about. Talking about media darling, though, we quite a fully completed I think Gilbert just threw over to me. Um, and yes, so essentially, Sculptform was this amazing project which got great media traction through different platforms. And that is all thanks to our talented PR team and also the drive from our client Sculptform. Um, a bit of a dream come true for myself was when we actually got to see Sculptform being featured as part of Frame Magazine's online platform. Um, and even having the opportunity as an emerging designer to present the entire testament to Woods Baggett and to Adam for supporting the next generation of design. For those who don't know, uh, Sculptform is a leading Australian architecture see we've lost you. Baton supplier. Just wait for the background to dull down. It should be okay now, Chrissy. Okay. Uh, for those who don't know, Sculptform is a leading Australian architectural and cladding batten supplier with a primary focus on innovative timber batten systems. Uh, Woods Baggett Principal Bruno Mendes was approached to participate in a design competition between us and another large scale Australian architectural studio. The brief was it was celebrate their product and their ethos. The existing site is located on Queen Street, which is 50 Queen Street, CBD. It is 500 square metres and located on the ground floor with great visual access to the street level um, from external to 
in the area. Like, as you can see in the floor plan and in the design images, it is pretty uninspiring and quite a um, It comprises of the ground floor, a mezzanine floor, the ceiling, water height on the ground floor. Um, and this really gave us an opportunity to do something really And there is something else that we be pushing beyond it. That team began to explore how we might be able to collaborate with the client and their experts. This collaboration leads to an innovative outcome. Um, so, as Ken mentioned earlier, the nature of this being a competition sparks an opportunity and creativity which may not have been available to us if it wasn't framed as a competition because the commission we would have been hesitant to put the idea as far as we did. We wanted to position our design as a showcase of sculpt form skill, ability and ethos. And we wanted their studio to live true to the brand and demonstrate what they're good at. And at the same time there was this nice duality where we also wanted to demonstrate our design capabilities and how we could um, deliver a groundbreaking uh, design vision. Phenomenal with Saget team involved in various phases of the project. Bruno Mendez, the project principal and design lead, created a team culture that promoted openness and a lack of hierarchy. I mean, everyone's idea, everyone's criticism was welcome to the table. It really helped open up the discussion and create an, a great flow between us all. Uh, one of the many positives of working in a large-scale office such as Woods Bagot is that we have great access to so many people with unique and complementary skill sets. So we had the team, we had the high-level idea, um, and now it was, start, it was about designing an actual outcome to present as part of the, the bid. Um, and as you can see here, in true architectural spirit, we began with pens and trace paper. Um, so... One day, uh, Bruno got us all to stand at a communal table where we all got our pens, started sketching, and he just asked us to draw forms within the site boundaries, which created this fundamental sketch, which would then be the catalyst for the design. Within the rigid boundaries uh, was this organic, rebellious form, uh, which created a looped journey. Uh, and at the centre of the organic form was this workshop where one-to-one -one prototypes can be made. Manufacturing is at the core of Sculptform's business and we wanted this to be showcased and celebrated for, you know, it, we wanted it to be a front of house feature, um, so a beacon that could be seen from street level and, and spark this idea of, of performance um, instead of it being a back of house item. This was a 3D model presented during the bid presentation to the client. The intent was to show that this design was to be an inserted sculpture within a space. And this was the final render in the bid process. It was high level, yet it still communicated an immersive experience and this idea of a, an organic form taking a visitor on the journey. So when we found out that we actually had won the projects, you know, we were absolutely elated because we truly believe that this will be a once in a career type of project. And we opened up the champagne and cheesed and celebrated when we could do that all together in the studio. Um, but then it dawned on us, we had a highly ambitious project and we needed to deliver it and rationalize it. So it was very important for us to then start thinking about, right, we, we can't stuff this up. The stakes are so high <laughs> and we want to make this a reality of what we envision, envisaged in our minds. And not long after that announcement, it was Bruno and Sue who approached me to ask if I could make the leap from project professional to project lead. And before I knew it, I was structuring fee proposals and resourcing schedules. And it was an incredible um, show of trust and support from Woods Bagger in someone at my level um, to be a project lead in this ambitious project um, and it sparked an opportunity for growth for myself. 
This is the overall plan, which was documented for construction. We spent a long time refining the curvature of the walls and creating a seamless flow in the space, um, especially given the nature of a curvy floor plate like this, making sure that it complied to relevant building codes as well. Um, the ground floor comprises of a multitude of different typologies for collaboration, including an open event space with auditorium seating, a high table and a lounge. Um, there's also a generous staff kitchen, which can host um, caterers when there's a large event and the gallery space with full height. Yep. 4.3 metres tall um, sliding panels showing Sculpt Forms product. Uh, as you follow the timber loop, the visitor can come up to the mezzanine floor um, and walk through the digital gallery where there's an opportunity to sit and, and look at Sculpt Forms um, previous projects and then through right through past the meeting rooms and the agile work stations. Um, through to the focus workstations. It should be noted as well that all um, all the joinery was all custom made and using Sculpt Forms products and finishes. Um, and then once you, you're able to loop back into the main space on the ground floor. It was really quite um, an important emphasis once we started adding materials to the journey because it really carved this uh, journey uh, being the white oak timber um, and then the negative spaces which created other opportunities for um, collaboration such as you know different uh, meeting spaces or quiet rooms and meeting um, and lounge spaces so the Material that is not um, American white oak timber is a terrazzo overlay and other soft finishes as well. Uh, our BIM guru Ali assisted in creating a fluid timber batten set out for the walls and ceiling using grasshopper and dynamo scripts. This was he was absolutely integral in um, really rationalizing the design and how we wanted to create this seamless effect um, and his the experience with as little joints as possible between the timber battens. This prompted Sculpt Form to investigate innovative ways of bending, steam bending timber and also prototyping new clip systems. And so this was the render which showcases the final refined design and you know our hopes and our dreams in, in a visualization. Our role was mostly finished at this point and we handed over our documentation and um, various visualizations to sculpt form for them to bring it to life. A lot of the site progress occurred earlier this year as we were transitioning from working from home, um, from the office to working from home due to COVID-19. Many of the details were rationalized uh, remotely via emails or video calls, which you know actually worked quite smoothly, surprisingly. Um, and Sculptform did an incredible job in translating our drawings into a built form. The image on the right hand side is really, it shows just how accurate and close to the visualization, the render that we had put forward um, to the built outcome. And so these are the final photos by Peter Bennett with feature lighting by Rakumba. Um, the feeling on arrival is this great sense of awe and true immersion in the experience of product and craftsmanship. Uh, we couldn't help but feel a little bit emotional being able to step into this space after um, thinking about it from this, this thought and, and an idea at competition phase. So this is a photo from the ground floor looking towards the workstations capturing on the left hand side the co-working collab workshop. The second image is looking from the agile workstations on the mezzanine floor over to the um, focused workstations and Sculptform did a fantastic job in, in engineering a free floating timber batten curtain, uh, which we like to call it, um, which shrouds the breakout space in the center and really divides the two spaces. And this has to be one of my favorite images just because it shows how organic and fluid and 
the attention to detail of this design and, and of sculpt form skill, of course. Um, and it's looking from the mezzanine level over to the stair, uh, down to the ground floor. And yeah, it was an absolutely phenomenal space to be in. And I think it's fair that we all agree that we cannot wait to get out of lockdown and back into the space and reconnect with our design community, which is what this space is intended to do. So now, finally, um, as part of our presentation, we'd like to share some of our lessons learned of these three different experiences in competition. My biggest lesson on Sculptform was to have trust. Bruno and Woodsbagger trusted me to lead project. Sculptform trusted us to design, take a high level design um, and translate it into a deliverable outcome. And Woodsbagger trusted Sculptform to respect the design integrity and stay true to what we had envisaged, which I believe was a great success. I think it's quite easy to be jaded by the whole process very easily, depending on budget and client restraints in the past. Um, but a personal note, most of all, I had to trust in myself that I could rise to the challenge of going from project professional to a, a project leader of a, such a complicated uh, project. And I know, Caitlin, you have a bit of understanding about trust and how teams operate with your strategic uh, work with Irico and also in your internal design competition. Yeah, absolutely. I think trust is such an important thing. And like you said, the trust of yourself, knowing that what you're doing is right and your gut instincts. The biggest thing that I learned from doing this competition and is what I show so much now in my work today is when you are given that little opportunity, how can you leverage it? So if you've given an inch, you run a mile. Like I did a little internal competition, but it turned into me doing all these public speaking events. It ended up there was an article in the press and it was about me networking. So for me, it really was knowing that when I see these opportunities, I can trust that I'm making the right decision for my own career and that it's right for me as well. And then I'm backing myself, like you said. And Gilbert, I'm really keen to hear from you when you work on so many competitions, like the nature of it, like you said, 30 competitions. We know we're just mathematically, some of them will be a loss. And I'm keen to hear about the resilience then that it's taught you of how do you come back from that? Well, I guess, as you both said, you know, it's all about trust. And when Woods Baggett trusted me with this role, I felt like it is such an honour coming out from uni to be trusted with something like this. And... I appreciate it because I did mention to them that I said I love doing concept, I love thinking about narrative and to be given a role that way, that is all I was, I'm was. i focusing most of the time. I feel like that is a trust on its own and I do not want to betray that trust. So, and also the, another thing about it is that I'm a competitive person naturally. So that competitive nature just kind of like, let me, like, you know, can push me down once, but then I can come up again a hundred times. And when you understand that a loss is never really a loss because there's always things that you pick it up from it, you realize that it's fine, I didn't get it this time. We're going to come back stronger next time and then we're not going to repeat the same mistake or we will learn from it. And hopefully it will be a better luck next time because luck plays a really big role in this as well. Yeah. Oh, can't hear you. Sorry, Adam, could you repeat that? Um, I think it's, I mean, it's really great to have you talk about um, your roles in the competition, um, what's going on. I think Joel's just telling me he can't hear me. So You're really low still, sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes! Yes! <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the sound tonight, but um, something's happening and Joel is looking at me as to whether it's good or bad. It's maybe not so good. But anyway, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, thanks for presenting the competitions. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the idea that, I mean, it's nice to hear the good stories of the competitions, but Gilbert, like, you must be, it must be frustrating. Like, you, do you ever follow a, comp a project through from a competition win to the end? Or is it just, are you, uh, kind of, your, your role within the practice is in the kind of front end only? Well, my role is mostly in front end only, even though I would like to work on a, comp on a project that, you know, I win and I continue throughout. But then the problem is, because I work on a competition regionally, the win might not necessarily be in Melbourne. 
so I guess that is a bit of a challenge in there as well. Yeah. But, you know, of course, when we don't win something, there is always disappointment. But, you know, you just can't keep on sobbing on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's important, the, uh, the, the kind of role you talk about in terms of taking the, the, the knowledge from the competition onto the onto the next competition is the similar knowledge I think um, Chrissy you're talking about in terms of taking the knowledge from a project onto the next project because the um, I mean, it depends a little bit where you come from in architecture uh, what is what is the nature of architecture is it is it kind of drawings is it buildings or is it a bit of both where is the kind of value in what we do but um, Chrissy I think uh, it's interesting to see I mean the three competition pro the processes in the office are quite interesting because there's obviously P Caitlin pulling someone from who from a a non-specific, oh, sorry, from a very specific role into a much more generalist position in that competition. Gilbert trying to look at a kind of much more generalist approach to the way in which competitions are done and the kind of focus on the competition as the project as opposed to necessarily the project as the project, the competition as the project. And then Chrissy very much about the idea that uh, in your case, the, the competition ended in a project and, and that project becomes the next project. So, so from your point of view, finishing that project, um, what do you hope, like, I mean, are you going to be using the, the, um, the sculpt form battens for the rest of your life? They're showing you some, <laughs> they're showing you some love in this, by the way, they're very excited. They're very happy with the result. They love the oh, project. Great. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, definitely like working with them. And I think that's, that's, the story at the end of the day was we had this amazing collaborative experience and that enabled us to put the design first and they came in later with the uh, buildability of the idea. So, I mean, if we could continue creating these crazy ideas and Sculptform uh, produces the same, then sure, <laughs> you know, why not? But, um, it's a nice way yeah. to learn a product, though. Like it's a nice way to it get is. a really in, inherent, uh, a really in-depth knowledge of a product or a process, and then be able to kind of influence the way you design in the future to kind of think about that in a way. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And Caitlin, um, coming from an education, kind of strategic education background, to kind of then dealing with, you know, in the competition you were presenting, bricks and mortar. How do we make this happen? Like in a field completely left of centre. How is it? How is like even thinking about that affected your kind of day to day um, strategic view of education? The way what we worked out really. We had all these ideas and we just weren't finding anything that stuck and there wasn't a glue. What happened then, we started thinking about it from the user's point of view and we based, we put little personas up and said, this is the person, this is, you know, they buy a house when they're 20 with a friend and then one of them gets, you know, shacked up and has a kid. The other person might need to move out. Then they go through different stages of their lives. They might have more kids. The kids move out of home. And it was that experience. As soon as we gave it the narrative like that, that's when the design just fell into place or the conversation and the narrative. And that has been a really great lesson that I've learned from that is, and that's something that I do so much in my role. I mean, my role is user strategy. So I have to always think from that end user. And so for having that experience of that light bulb moment of knowing when it just clicked over has some, yeah, it's been really great for me in and, that way. And so in a role within the practice, do you, do you take, do you go start to finish on projects or is you much more in the kind of initial, similar to Gilbert, where you're in the initial strategic view to set up the strategy for the education project and then yeah. pass it off or? Now, I'm now very specialised. I'm a registered architect as well. So I have gone end to end as well. But my role now is really around that strategic side, master planning, strategic briefs as well. I might work on a project for two years before the functional brief is even established. And then it hands over to Gilbert to then do the competition, to then hand over to Chrissy who would do the delivery. So I'm a very pre-architect coming on board, which it's interesting point of view to have that relationship with the client and then start seeing how you can write the brief. So I think you alluded to the idea of competitions being sometimes a bit of a negative thing in the industry as well, because if it goes out to a big design comp, how do you protect the client's building and that whole process so what I try and do then is really write a great process and get the strategy right so if it does go down the comp end that we can trust that we've got the basis of the building and right yeah yeah I mean I think one of the most um one of the most important things around a competition is uh, the right brief 
I mean, the right briefs, the right jury, the right site, and there's so many times when we see, you know, competitions which might have, you know, a, a brief which is just ill-conceived, and it kind of is so frustrating. It's really amazing to think that there's people like you out there um, involving in that kind of upfront brief writing process, because really, um, you know, it's, it is absolutely we, we're, we're massive. I'm a massive advocate of ensuring that. That more architects do more things across the built environment. So sit in planning, sit in uh, client side, in development, sit in competitions. I think it's a really super. It's a super important role that architects play in the in the in the kind of establishment of projects. So that um, actually the design work that you know Gilbert gets to do and Chrissy gets to do at the moment um, can actually be done in a manner which is proactive. I mean, I, mean, I am interested, Gilbert. Um, you're all competition. All competition. <laughs> we'll have the time. <laughs> How yeah, would they? Except sometimes. What would be? Uh, I mean, a, a straight commission would be nice occasionally. Definitely. Um, you know, sometimes I think the frustrating things about competition, beside a loss, is actually competition that doesn't have a result. You know, sometimes you join, you put in all this effort, and then you just never hear back from them. And I think yeah. that even much more frustrating than facing a loss because that's when you realize that you're like did we even do well or yeah, did we yeah, not yeah. do well like you just couldn't measure yourself in that yeah. bar you're like yeah. what is happening here but definitely of course like you know commission is much better than competition but i think that is something that is really valuable about competition is that the fact that it pushed us further i think competition should really trigger that because we have to be speculative of like what is new mm. what mm -hmm. is Done. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always interesting when you do a competition or you do a submission and you never hear anything, and it's kind of a, that lack of acknowledgement, I think, from a client about the amount of effort and pressure and in intellectual input that goes into competition. I do very much feel like, in it, within our society, at least, competitions are undervalued as a as a as a resource in the amount of money and expertise that goes into that kind of that lost intellectual property. I've always thought of. Um, at one point in my life, running a competition which was not uh, uh, not pitting architects against each other, but all uh, saying essentially, uh, running a competition was called the big urban think, where everybody knows you and Melburnians, you'd know your your five kilometre radius particularly well at the moment. But you know, choosing you have to choose a site and do a do a scheme on a site within five kilometres of your house. So it was very much about a local response to a local condition and that we presented those because in a way there might be even more opportunity for a project to be built out of that because then you get different people a kind of much broader section of the po of the population looking at ideas that architects are generating beyond the kind of organized competitions where you might have a one in 100 or at the best maybe one in 20 one in one in five chance of winning a competition um, perhaps you all, perhaps we could do it. Perhaps I could get you guys to, you know, run the competition. Yeah, that actually sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds Have like a, a bit of placemaking and everything, which, you know, I absolutely love as well. Empowering the community to actually put forward ideas is so important and something that us as architects should actually start investigating more. Of. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be nice to think about a kind of uh, globalism, kind of global knowledge, Localism. global knowledge, local ideas. You know, look, think, take your take your significant, uh, amazing knowledge uh, as individuals and focus it on a site close to you where where no one else is thinking. You know, take that knowledge and put it into a, in a into a into kind of something where the community could potentially get some value out of it. Who knows? Out of a I think too, like the architecture industry in nature is very collaborative because we've all gone through those hours, those long nights, slogging it out back in the uni days, doing the all nighters. So we've built a strong community. So now like most of my really good friends are still architects. So we have that sense of working together, but then in winning for projects, it's real battle against each other. So it is interesting if we could do something that was more Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, kind of using our network or our community in a collaborative way rather than in a, in a um, 
competitive way. I mean, I think competitions yeah. there there are there are kind of collaborative competitions. I mean, we I always love going to competitions because you always know the other four teams. Generally, you always know the other yeah. four teams that are presenting. You say hello and you really hope <laughs> that the best scheme wins. You know, you're very happy to lose a competition when when someone else's scheme is better. You're very unhappy if the scheme that wins is not as good as the scheme that you presented. <laughs> totally, totally agree with that. Yeah. Generally, that happens when there's a bad brief or a jury that doesn't know much about the type of competition that they're judging, uh, which, I, at least in my in my experience, that's what I found. Ooh, I got a really crazy sound. Thanks, I appreciate you all coming on. I'm so, 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 so sorry that we've had a problem with the audio tonight. I have no idea why. There is nothing different to the setup tonight that we've had in the last... 25 talks <laughs> I'm not sure if it's just because um, just because uh, there's three of us on three of you online and me on the other line but um, I really apologize I'll see what I can do about editing it a little bit so that we can uh, maybe take out some of the gaps we might even I might even be in contact and we might record a little bit of yeah. you to, to like fill the time. gap and we might push it back yeah. in again <laughs> yeah more than feel happy. free to yeah we're still in lockdown so there's really not much else we can do exactly I can I can seduce you all to do an extra hour <laughs> but just for me <laughs> um, yeah we really appreciate it and thanks to also to Woods Bagger, it takes a lot of um, trust, I would say, to for a company to allow people, um, you know, with with the experience that you have, you know, you have significant experience, but not you're not the leaders of the practice in terms of the owners of the business. So it takes a lot of um, trust from the leaders and the owners of the practice to uh, kind of. Uh, let you talk in this way and be be the public face, um, the bright young things of Wits Baggett. So thank you, really appreciate it. Say so thank you to your um, studio leads for us. Um, again, we re I really appreciate um, you coming on tonight. It's been a really great opportunity for me to look back and have a look at competitions and think about it. Um, it's a really important part of the architectural community. I think it's an undervalued part of the architectural community in terms of the amount of effort we put into competitions. Um, some of you may have seen we had a... Uh, uh, the failed competitions uh, uh, model exhibition on at the bookshop. When we closed the bookshop, we had one week where we had still paying rent, and we thought, mm, why not? So we put everyone's everyone brought their competitions model, models in, and we showed that. So it was a really nice thing, yeah. and the the quantum of energy that was put into those models just you know blew me away. Um, so again, thank you very much to you all. Thank you to Woods Baggett. Thank you to everybody for listening. There's also someone, C. Swankia from the United States who gets up at 3 a.m. every time. Yay to you. That's so impressive. <laughs> all, oh the Europe, all the Europeans get to have breakfast and the, uh, and the Americans have to get up at 3 a.m. in the morning. So that's wow. fantastic. <laughs> it's thank so impressive, so isn't it? <laughs> um, but yeah, we will see you next week. Um, we have a... Um, a branch architecture studio coming on uh, so thank you to, to those to, to branch for agreeing and we'll have a few more that I'll announce next week so thank you every month thank you Adam thank, thank you, you. Bye. thanks guys that you can stay online for a little bit